We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words from the Declaration of Independence are familiar to many of us, and yet it took 143 years for women to get the right to vote, and 189 years for black people to get the right to vote. And still today, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are still only words for many people. Here in Boston, Life expectancy varies by 30 years, depending on where you live. In Roxbury, with many poor and black people, life expectancy is 59 years. In the Back Bay, wealthy and mostly white, life expectancy is 91 years. It's tough to have liberty when you are in prison. The United States incarcerates 716 people for every 100,000 people. Our rate of incarceration is more than five times higher than most countries in the world. Millions of people in our country don't have health care, a decent job, good education, a home they can afford, and that makes it pretty hard to pursue happiness. So on this show, you are going to meet people who are making it possible to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People today who are making the words of the Declaration of Independence come true. Hi, uh, welcome to We Hold These Truths. My name is Michael Jacoby Brown. I'm your host for We Hold These Truths, and today we're really lucky and honored to have as our guest Zakia Alake. Zakia, welcome. Thank uh, you. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about yourself <laughs> and where you're from and where your interests and values in justice and organizing to make the world a better place. Where, where did that come from? And, well, you know. today I'm coming from Hope Recovery Communities. Now, mm. hope for us means helping other people escape. Mm. And we started in the first couple of months of the COVID lockdowns when we noticed that so many people who are in recovery from substance abuse could no longer go to the comfort of their 12-step communities because they were locked out of the houses of worship that mm. traditionally have been the home of these 12-step groups. Mm. Uh, so, um, both Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous slowly incorporated um, virtual meetings. Mm. But in between, what we thought of was, well, we can have a private Facebook page where mm. people can talk to each other. Mm. And we tried to <coughs> schedule um, people who would be uh, moderators. But as an all-volunteer effort, it was pretty catch as catch can. And mm -hmm. it's dangerous to have a um, unmoderated Facebook group like yeah. that when people are in crisis. Yeah. Well, um, tell me also a little bit about where you come from, where you were born, and <laughs> where you grew up, I was and, born. and where your values came uh, from, okay. while you're doing uh, this I'm, instead of... I'm the kid of lunch bucket Democrats, um, union people. Mm. Uh, so I was born in Lemister, Massachusetts, but mm. I was raised in Sterling, Massachusetts. Mm. I'm originally a twine from Twine Road, named after my, f my paternal grandfather, who mm. unfortunately died a few days before I was born. I didn't get to meet mm. him, but mm. he was an organizer in the railroads with uh, mm. A. Philip Randolph. Wow. My father wow. Uh, was not a official organizer in a union, but he damn sure brought huh. union teaching home to us. Really? He was uh. a construction laborer most of his life. Wow. Um, he was a, um, a vet and a very strong believer in the promise of America. Hmm. Um, even though I don't, know, I don't know for sure if he ever read Langston Hughes's book, right. America Will Be, right. he believed it. And he, right. he thought that we should fight really hard to make sure that America lived up to its uh, promises. So uh, it really started for me with the ubiquitous uh, UNICEF box. Oh, this is trick-or-treating for UNICEF back in the day. I don't know if they do that. I don't anymore. know if they do that. Really? But they, my parents <coughs> embedded in me early on that I could change the world with this damn UNICEF box. Really? No, that's great. That there were these starving children 
somewhere, China, right. Africa, but they weren't where we lived. Not in Sterling. They weren't in Sterling. Uh, what was that like growing up uh, for you? <sighs> it was a mixed bag. I mean, yeah. um, no, me. we were the only colored family left after World War II, from what I understand, really? because wow. Daddy's uh, brother and sister, once they got introduced to big city life during World War II, <laughs> they didn't. They didn't come back until they were ready to retire. But, um, Uncle oh, really? Alec was in Detroit working huh. for Ford, and Aunt right. Bessie, let me put my hand over my heart, she became a nurse in hmm. Boston and worked, uh, as, as karma would have it, with substance abuse and mental health. Oh, really? Yeah, and I had no interest in that as a kid. I wanted to be a nurse until I saw my dog have puppies, and then I realized that I didn't want anything to do with the medical field. <laughs> so it was the unions and the, the UNICEF unions and, and the UNICEF. UNICEF. But the, the UNICEF box, that ubiquitous UNICEF box, just meant the world to me that just going door to door as I got my treats, saying to the people, the adults, couldn't you have pennies for mm -hmm. UNICEF so we can feed the hungry children? Right, trick and treat for, trick UNICEF. And treat for right. UNICEF. Right, right. So tell us a little bit about what <laughs> happened after that, after, after you got done trick or treating. After uh, that was the Vietnam War. More so than the Civil Rights Movement. The Civil Rights Movement really didn't catch on in little 2,500 person uh, Sterling Junction, Massachusetts. But in Worcester, the, the, the Vietnam War, anti-Vietnam War movement mm. was huge. Abby Hoffman is from Worcester. Right, right. So, or was, I think he's passed away now. Right. So there seemed to be a lot of activity around that. And the Civil Rights Movement came to me more as a, a very distant, uh, connection through Ebony Magazine. I miss Ebony Magazine. Oh, right. Because right. Ebony Magazine was in every black f family's home. Mm. Even if it was one dog-eared copy that went through aunties and cousins and uncles, everybody had access to it. And so you read Lerone Bennett's teachings of the month on both black history, f oh, really, history, yeah. and what's going on in the here and now, mm. which brings me Right. To my prop for today. Oh, that's great. This right. book, putting the movement back into civil rights teaching, um, reminds me of the importance that the Lerone Bennett um, ed op eds played in my life in Ebony mm. Magazine. And, and the, the answer was always, as Gene uh, McGuire would say right now, don't agonize, organize. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> the first time I got a chance to organize around anything was indeed the um, the anti-Vietnam uh, War uh, mm -hmm. marches in Worcester, uh, whatever they were. Mm -hmm. I was at Wachusett Regional High School in oh, Holden. Really? High school. Yeah. Really? Wow. Well, Sterling is too small even now right. to support its own high school, so mm -hmm. they were uh, uh, one of five members of a regional high school, Wachusett Regional High School. Um, so I would... Um, skip school and play hooky once in a while and go to um, anti-Vietnam War marches. Then I uh, left home and went to D.C. I ended up going to high, uh, college uh, through a government program called um, Community Education and Training Act of 1974. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a CETA kid. I went to law school. Oh, right. I am a law school trained paralegal. Wow. At this was the what, School what for Radicals, 1978 to 1980. Mm -hmm. um, I actually finished right. early, but I right. uh, technically I was on the books there from 70. Oh, this history is important. This is when Jimmy yeah, Carter was president. It was when Jimmy Carter was president, and, and he did not renew that. And I don't know the politics behind it. But anyway, I got to go to what well, was a well, law school. Ronald for Reagan be became president yeah, January 20th, 1981. Yeah, but we were told while we were in school that it was the Carter administration that. Oh, really? Yeah, I have to look into okay. it because it really, it was such a great program. We earned while we learned. And so the, as a paralegal, they put us in the intake clinic for the JDs, the, the, the law school candidates. Um, and and um, the deans, the co-deans were Gene and Edgar Kahn. And mm. now the school was closed. The Reagan administration put them out of business. They stopped letting them have student loans. You mm. couldn't, all kinds of stuff that they supposedly did to them. But it, it was definitely a school for radicals. 
and now it's a part of the University of the District of Columbia. It has been for a couple of decades. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go visit for the first time since I left D.C. in 1979. I'm going to go back next uh, this week, coming uh, sun Saturday. I leave for a conference, and I'm going to go visit the campus so for the first time. Yeah, I came when back did you home. Came back home into I Boston. came back in '79, and I tr I um, got into UMass Boston's College of Public and Community Service, oh, yeah. and they had this group meeting on campus of of students and scholar activists fighting the uh, gov uh, governor Ed King was trying to cut back on. Women, mothers on welfare being able to go to college. Mm. So I, I got a, to be a part of that. Mel King was teaching us organizing along with oh, Ann really? Withhorn and stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. In fact, Mel King, um, I, I said that I would love to move to Boston and do this full time. He helped me get an affordable apartment. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yep. What, what year was this? 19, I moved in the, the night that Reagan was elected. I moved to Boston November with my two 19, little kids. November eight. 3rd, 1980. Wow. Yeah. With two little kids. Wow. Yeah, one was five, Jamal. He just turned 50 on Friday. Oh, and wow. then Delante was um, just short of 2.9 years because he couldn't go into daycare yet. Oh, That's so why I remember. What was that like? Coming here with two little kids. Wow! It was it was um, an amazing time. Francesca Smith. Yeah, yeah. She was a, an intern at College of Public and Community Service. She was a grad student mm. for um, oh God, what was that program she worked in in the 70s and 80s? Rock the vote. Oh, okay. Okay, so she was working with a professor at CPCS, and there were days when I had no daycare for my kids. Right. She watched my kids at her desk while I went to class. Wow. And we were studying organizing. We were studying community planning. We were, what's it called, praxis? Yeah. Thinking, mm -hmm. studying, and doing. And so that's where my uh, first, I guess, uh, I'm not guess, I know. That's where I officially learned hmm. um, community organizing from Mel King he was like a senior advisor to us, I guess mm -hmm. you'd say. And um, he got us into the state house and he made sure that we were heard and we won over and over and over again. So we what won. kind of things did you win? And well, what we did you won work things like uh, this. Governor King, all governors up until King, and in the beginning he had it, they had the right to declare mm -hmm. when winter came. Now, why is that important? Because you know, in the 70s, the cost of energy starts going up, and women mm. and their children, you know, men weren't allowed to be on welfare, uh, aid to dependent families with children. Say that the, uh, the light bill, the um, <coughs> heating bill was so high, you needed extra help from the government. Well, you couldn't get it if the governor hadn't declared it was winter. Right. Do you hear me? He I hear you. had to... De could be snowing, it could but be snowing, snowing in November, deep. but it's not winter. It's not winter yet. Right. So it's you couldn't get emergency assistance. Oh, really? We fought yeah. and got that changed. And, and I think oh, it, was, wow. um, it was state reps and senators whose names you would recognize now, like Pat Jalen. Oh, yeah, she's um, still in there. Mel King, of course. Yeah, right. Oh, I can't think of anybody else who's still around and alive. Yeah. But they, they were so helpful, and we won. Oh, this is great. What we else won. kind of things Well, did you we do? won the right to continue going to school. Oh, wow. That's um, I think there were some catches to it, but we, we basically uh -huh. mostly won that. The problem was we weren't so good at the structure of our organization. Mm. We were called Coalition for Basic Human Needs. Right. We did not plan well around what to do with women as we progressed through college and got jobs. Mm. So, for example, when I got a job, they s um, the board said, oh, well, you can't be a member anymore. You have a job now. You're not going to be on welfare. We had no plan oh. about what to do. We didn't plan on success for ourselves. Uh -huh. That's very, that's an important yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and why and do you think that was? Why do you think you didn't plan on success? I don't think we did much planning around the organization itself. 
I think oh, we I planned yeah. more around organizing campaigns. Like action. Yep, I think, and I, that still is a problem. It's just like the one of the most successful things I've ever worked on in my life was stopping, I hate that it was stopping something, but, but yeah, okay. stopping Mayor Menino's administration from putting an asphalt plant at the nexus of, well, right where they call Mass and Cass. I don't right. like to call it Methadone Mile right. because I would prefer to say Miracle Mile because I don't know what those people will do tomorrow. Right. Tomorrow might be the day that they choose recovery and they become miracles. But anyway, um, so he was going to let one of his big donors put an asphalt plant right there. and Next to the hospital. <clears throat> next to the hospital, next to the jail, next to the edge of what was then Orchard Park, right. public so housing. Right, can get sicker. But what <laughs> it was also at the edge of a South Boston uh, located elementary school. Oh. So Jimmy Kelly and Stevie Lynch, who was a state rep right then, um, so this was 1993 to 1998, mm. I think, yeah. It, I never thought I'd work with folks from South Boston on mm -hmm. anything. Mel King was so impressed with the work we did. I joined something that was already started called mm -hmm. the Coalition Against the Asphalt Plant. Mm -hmm. A man named Lloyd Fillion somehow found me and recruited mm -hmm. me. Um, he was a, one of the leaders of um, uh, the last of the anti-death um, penalty advocates, mm -hmm. and they stopped meeting because they basically won. It's not going to be any death right, penalty. Right, anyway. I understand. So I, I so joined and... I was a leader from Roxbury of it, right. so it was it was place based. It was Roxbury, Dorchester, South End, um, and South Boston. And the South Boston white folks. Uh, at yes, that time. but I sat in meetings, just me, Jim Kelly, and Stevie Lynch, and I listened to things like this. Listen, zucchini, they're coming up with some strategies that just won't work for the good, hardworking people of South Boston now. I understand that some of your friends from Greenpeace, they want you to, to, to go and boycott and protest in front of Menino's inauguration. We can't do that. I said, no. That's smart. <laughs> I said, we can't? He said, oh, no, we wouldn't be able to support that. So I thought about it, and I said, well, what do you think we should do? He said, we should start a campaign called mothers and children against the asphalt plant. And we think that Jews should bring flowers to the mayor <laughs> from the children. Bring flowers? Yes. And we will have the media there for you. Brother, it made international news. Right. Black and white women right, right, right. with their children asking the mayor. Yeah. It, I, was I, I, that was, it was I, I, brilliant. It was brilliant. I want to go back to why, and we won. why the Coalition <laughs> for Basic Human Needs didn't plan for getting successful, getting off welfare. I, I think That's hardly anyone. Anyway. Hell, uh, Section 8 doesn't plan for, no, I, for I us to get successful. No, I, I understand, yeah, no. but what do you think's going on there within the organization? Uh, I, I mean, my <sighs> sense is you might be, how do you feel about yourself? Are you going to be a kind of person that's going to get off welfare, right. that's going to graduate Because it doesn't make sense. College. We were in college, all of us. We were right there at UMass Boston College of Public and Community Service. It makes sense to think ahead. Yeah. Does it mean, but then, I, okay, now I remember, I'm age. I didn't have the class aspirations that some of them had. Some mm. of them were quite happy graduating and saying, see you to oh, the Coalition, okay. coalition oh, really? for Basic Human Needs. So that was just one chapter, by the way. Yeah, okay. There were chapters in other parts of Massachusetts. We imploded uh, around, the, around that time when they were saying, you got to go, you got to go, you got to go because you have jobs. Mm. Grace Ross becomes the coordinator of the next iteration of it, and they became the next, I don't even remember if they kept the mm. same name, of the next welfare rights uh, mm -hmm. organization for mm -hmm. the state. But I didn't think about it for years that there was, this, oops, um, right. we should have been, it's hard to do all that, as you well know, yeah. but all those things that go into building and, and maintaining successful 
community organizations? Right. Are they going to be a full-fledged organization? Are they just going to be a campaign for the moment right. until success is reached? Right. It, it takes That's a lot. That's a lot. How do you build an organization that will exist through time? And I think, yeah. and I'm going to say this as a black person, yeah, right. I think that of over the 400 years we've been in this country, many times we've <laughs> been afraid to cast a critical lens on our work and publicly say, mm. you know, that move right there didn't work. Mm -hmm. Let's tinker with it. And that, again, I'm going to pull my prop up. Yeah, no, when no. I finished my producer training for Boston Neighborhood Network, uh, the show, and I don't want to call it my show, but the show is going to be based in part on putting the movement back into civil rights teaching mm -hmm. and acting. Mm -hmm. See, it's okay to, ha to cast a constructive critical eye on our work and say, mm. you know, you're not a bad person. A lot of times people step up to the plate and they have goodwill but not necessarily good skills. Mm -hmm. I'm coming to your retreat mm -hmm. as an organizer. I'm 68 years old. I've I been know. trained maybe 10, 15 times. There'll never be enough opportunities. I want to keep growing. Yeah, it's great. I want to keep growing. I don't think enough people say that and I think that many folks that identify as being from oppressed communities secretly feel that way. They're just not talking about it yet. But I think the younger people are, are helping. S secretly feel what way? Well, that, that we should be more constructively critical. Mm -hmm. That it's okay to look yeah. back. Is there a succession plan for the most successful um, uh, urban homemaker program in Black Boston, the Caribbean Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, the delightful, oh uh, God, Beulah Providence. Mm -hmm. Is there a succession plan? Mm -hmm. Is there? Because if there isn't, we are screwed from a dizzying height. Yep. Because her program, I can tell you, having worked with people with mental health and substance abuse disorders who have a hard time a lot of times getting and keeping that personal care attendant, that um, urban home, that homemaker that the Mass Health mm -hmm. pays for, she's trained these people to do great work for very low pay in our community. Is there a succession plan? I don't know. Right, so it's paying attention right. to the right. details of the organization. You're exactly. Saying that often doesn't come. Because yes, because we're so busy doing the work. But, the action, but, but not building the organization. Yes, yeah. and so, then the, the yeah. one that looks like they did have a succession plan is Project Hope, mm. right there on um, Magnolia Street, Magnolia mm. and Dudley. Right. The the uh, originator of many. Um, Oh, uh, several um, family family what do you, shelters, but with programming to help women get back on their feet, um, learn um, marketable skills. I don't want. I hate sounding like that. Yeah. But so they could get a good job, yeah. hopefully, or, or open daycare programs at home themselves, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. When Sister Margaret Leonard retired, right. their quality didn't change. I was a neighbor for nine years. I know their quality didn't change. You still couldn't tell as you walked up the street that it was a group home. They had you, a plan. They right. had a plan. They must have. Right. But we don't know that for sure because we've never said, can we study you? How did you do that? Right. So Google. that we can have a guidebook right. Right. to pass on to the next generation. Right. So what would you say for someone starting out who's, you've been doing this a long time and a lot of different areas, what do you say are some of the main lessons you would suggest to someone who's starting out wanting to make the world a better place. What would you say are hmm. the important things they should pay attention to? Check your ego. Check your ego. What check else? Check your ego. Um, yeah. what, what do you mean by check your ego? That's <laughs> when we work, when I, w in my work with people in recovery, hmm. even though I'm, I'm, I'm publicly identified as a heathen, <laughs> God, small g, ego, easing God out. Hmm. Okay. So maybe for me, easing God out is not thinking about you. Mm. So I don't want that to happen. I want to always think as we, not mm. me. 
somebody used to say to me, it's not that I think less of myself, mm. it's that I think of you more. But not in a mm. self-abusive way. It's that, yeah. I, like, I don't want to just keep this and do it all on my own. I want to do this in alliance with others and say, right. can we create a television program for our um, community cable access show such that we teach people what we did and what we think we're going to do and show them how they can do it in their own neighborhoods. For example, mm -hmm. the last thing I said to Francesca as we were leaving the meeting today, three years ago I found out in a Boston Globe article that there were several schools in Boston that didn't have libraries and I have agonized about that. But three years later I've done nothing about right. it. Who's going to teach me what I need to know so that mm -hmm. I could individually take action? Even if mm -hmm. the individual action is knock on my cousin's doors and say, would y'all join me in calling the school department every right. day, send in emails, something. something. What, what else would you say is important for people to know if they're starting out? Check your ego at the door, you say. Make mm -hmm. sure that there's a need for what you plan to do. Make sure there's a need to, don't <laughs> just think because... Yeah. Yeah. Something you care about, everyone else does too. Yeah, I looked. Um, how, and how do you make sure there's a need? Yeah, that's the, that's. How the, do you do that? It, it's almost like formulaic. I mean, well, for example, there's the Lewis D. Brown Peace Institute, sure. and you know what that's for. Yeah, yeah. I, know. I feel like that, yeah. every time I turn around, one of the parents that she's helped is branching off and making their own organization to help um, survivors of homicide. Now, somebody might hear me say that and say, Zakia, you're just evil. No. <laughs> She's been doing this for 30 years, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Are you quite sure that you need to start a brand new organization? Mm -hmm. Or is it just one, like, there's this one woman I know that I've actually helped with this. She started the can I, her grandson who was murdered at four years old, name was Kanai White. She started the Kanai White, no, his name was Kanai, okay, Can, can I, K A N, I mean C A N, like Can I Help or something. It's because she noticed when she had to go to court behind his murder, you can't bring little kids in the courtroom unless they're a, um, a, 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 a testifying. So people need daycare if they're not used to having daycare for the kids so that her family raises money every year now so that somebody can come and say, I need to, s and so, she found so, a daycare to help. So she identified, she identified that, need. that need. So you do it, so that's important. That's don't important. Just think with just you don't and your think best you friend, can, you, know, yeah, you, you can, know what is important. Yeah. Well, what else would you say is important for people to pay attention to? Uh, you would, um, you be, be honest about your skill level and mm. don't be afraid. I work with people who are functionally illiterate, mm. but they get work done because they know they are, and they say, Michael, could you read this for me? Mm -hmm. uh, Zakia, can you check the agenda? Does this make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that kind of thing. Okay. And then look around at a place like Roxbury Community College and say, they're opening up a center for economic and social something, I think, coming up soon. I forgot yeah. the last word of it. Can they have a capacity building project for us so that mm. micro nonprofits and others can get the tools they need? Mm -hmm. And maybe it's a self-assessment that, geez, I just don't have it in me to do a full-fledged program mm -hmm. or an organizing campaign but I can do this one little thing. Brother Robert Kenny used to always say to us, mm -hmm. if everybody does a little, no one has to do a lot. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is brilliant. But yeah. I like to keep it on the community organizing side. So, okay, Michael, let me ask you a question. What's the most important, most important thing we can say to people to help turn these ideas into organizing campaigns to change right. something? Yeah. I think it's about building relationships. And yeah, trust. you always say that. I mean, it's that's true. what I've observed. It's Organizations true. fall apart, or like you said, you know, without the planning and understanding and trust. Yeah. Like, why do you not trust someone who gets a job and goes to college when yeah. you're on welfare? Yeah, I mean, yeah. why couldn't you have made us 
I don't know, just, an advisory council or, or something. Yeah. But or say, well, you don't get to vote. I don't know. Or, but whatever. But just but buy. Think about it. Yeah. So you're <laughs> losing power. Yeah. yeah. So these are great lessons, and uh, Sakia Laki has been working for justice since she was trick or treating for <laughs> UNICEF back 60, more than 60 years ago, oh, and man. learning the lessons about unions and from mm -hmm. your parents, which is. <laughs> Where a lot of us have learned. But would a lot you of have things. believed I learned a lot from Jim Kelly and Stevie Lynch? Yeah, we. Uh, yeah. <coughs> it was a very remarkable experience. Right. Well, we say there's no permanent friends, no permanent, <laughs> no permanent. enemies. <laughs> yep. And uh, those flowers for Mayor Menino. Oh my God. Were, uh, <laughs> real important. It worked. So I, I hope this was helpful for you that get a chance to watch Zakia Laki. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate. You're watching us this long, Zakia. I appreciate all you are doing, all you have done, and all you will do, because I know you're not done yet. I'm not done no, yet. Need, no, and so I just really appreciate your being here, sharing some of these lessons. And uh, my name again, uh, in case you forgot, <laughs> it was uh, about a half hour ago, is Michael Jacoby Brown. I'm your host for the We Hold These Truths. And today we were, again, very lucky to have Zakia Alaki, a colleague and friend of mine. Thank you, uh, Who's been working for justice for 60 plus years <laughs> and is keeping at it. And uh, so thanks oh. for watching. Thanks, Zakia. And uh, I hope you'll uh, pay attention to what uh, Zakia said because there's a lot of wisdom in this, uh, th this woman's heart. So thanks a lot for watching, and I uh, hope you'll tune in next time when we have uh, we hold these truths. Again, my name's Michael Jacoby Brown. I'm honored to be your host, and we're honored to have today uh, Zakia Alaki. Thank you very much. ACMI productions are only made possible with your support. Visit patreon.com slash ACMI to learn how you can help.